This is all mine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I wouldn't have missed this for the world. All right. Hi. So today is June 24th, 2021. And we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata extinctionati. And we're joined today by Spencer McCall, who directed uh, the Jejun Institute and On Bright Axiom. And today we're, we have them because um, we're interested in knowing more about ARGs and just about that, uh, those concepts. So I'll start it off. Um, Hugh, do you wanna, do you have any questions you have, you wanna start off with? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I mean, I gotta do a little spiel here because um, I don't know how many people have told you this, but in your life, but uh, you've certainly been responsible for directing the last 10 years of my life. So <laughs> let me, <laughs> let me tell you the, my story. So um, I was a green tech entrepreneur and uh, basically a, an activist, climate activist, and I was looking for, you know, rebellion and social change and ways to reinvent it, you know, particularly after the failure of um, all these things like the Occupy movement and, and the, the Arab Spring and stuff. And I was thinking, you know, the Gene Sharp kind of methodologies, all these kind of nonviolent uh, Gundy tactics, MLK and stuff. I just, the, the, it's just not working. Nothing is working. There's, uh, you know, we need so we desperately need social change. We need a revolution, um, and uh, we just can't get there with these traditional you know, techniques that have been developed by activists for so long. And so, I was roughly thinking of ARGs, and I came across the Institute movie because uh, you know, it was just part of my research into ARGs. I had a vague notion that you could use an ARG. But the, my real moment of epiphany was watching the Institute. And the exact moment of my epiphany was when uh, there's this one scene you, you might probably remember where you're interviewing this girl who participated in the game. And she's talking about the planet elsewhere. And she bursts into tears right in the middle. And, and I thought, that's incredible. I mean, you, I can't think of anybody that would burst into tears about solar panels or Green New Deals or, the, you know, the polar bears or the whales. Going. And here's this bizarre fictional world that she's so devoted to, she just basically breaks into tears. So I, I had a background in cults and stuff like that. I'm deeply immersed in that kind of thing. I, I suddenly the kid made the connection. I thought, this is it. <laughs> that you can do world-changing stuff with this. And then, then I gather that uh, Jason uh, Segal, is that right? Siegel? Jason Siegel, Siegel. yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he also must have been on the same wavelength because he came out with, you know, the AMC dispatches from elsewhere. Um, so, so that's my story. <laughs> Do you have anything to say to that? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to get dour or anything, but uh, yeah, Kiyomi, um, Kiyomi is the the person we're interviewing during that, and you know, we wanted to play with reality, and a lot of people accused at times everybody in that of being an actor. Um, there are a couple interviews that are actually there's only one interview that is a, an act or a plant. Um, somebody to just blur that line to get you to question what's real and what's what's not. Kiyomi was not one of those people. She was a real participant who, you know, named yeah, her dog Shijun. I've got the feeling she wasn't she wasn't acting yet. Yeah. I don't I think mean, that good an actor. Right? <laughs> I mean I for a long time I didn't want to give away who was the plant, but it's the the guy who claims to break into the house and go into the sewer, and that was part of the experience. But everybody else is is real, including the the guy in the wheelchair who wanted his face blurred. Um, but Kiyomi was real. She named her dog Jijun. She got a tattoo uh, of some of the nonchalance symbology. And and while the story was important to her, what what she really was breaking down about was like those moments of coincidence um, and what they mean. And, and for me, coincidence has always been um, kind of these forward looking breadcrumbs um, where I feel like I'm, I'm very agnostic. I'm, I'm not <laughs> a theist in any way, raised Jewish, but kind of gave that up as with many people who got involved in this. And I can come back to that in a second. But I love the idea that when I'm ever curious if I'm on the right path, 
I get these glimpses of coincidences or um, maybe even deja vu, um, but just these moments of that snap me out of reality and put me in this headspace of, of there being the potential for magic when really so much of our lives is spent, you know, driving from point A to point B. I've got to go mail this letter. I've got to do this in life for a lot of people, especially disenfranchised people can just be, what is the point of this? What are, what are we doing? Life is miserable. It's a lot of suffering. And maybe there are these moments of connection to a clue or connection to another human being that can be so valuable. Um, and so, yeah, with, with Jason, you know, uh, a couple years after it had come out and we just really had no idea like how, how it would resonate. We just knew it kind of these themes of resonance uh, meant something important to to us. Um, but Jason, yeah, he saw it. It got we were lucky enough to get on Netflix, which at the time, you know, they didn't have a lot of original content, so they were sweeping up indie indie stuff, and we were really, really lucky. I don't think they do that quite as much anymore. But you know, it was just this happy series. Almost the entire process after the whole thing was done was this process of these happy accidents, luck, and coincidences that brought it to Jason, a seagull, or his attention, and uh, he asked to meet and uh, came, at the time I was living in the Bay Area, I'm in LA now, but um, he came and met, and we just had this wonderful conversation about um, kismet, and just, uh, you know, these little connections that you get to make, and you get to make with other people, um, and, and how for a lot of people in our lives, uh, it's hard to make a social connection. It's hard to, um, you know, make a friend. And what we kind of realized was like one tool or technology for making like an actual spiritual or personal relationship was to give people a shared mission. Um, I feel like you could, to just put it in terms of like dating or something, you could go on a dating app and you can set up a date and you can, um, you know, sit there kind of awkwardly and try to like make something happen. But I think a more powerful way to establish a relationship with anybody, uh, whether it's a friendship or romantic or, you know, or even a business colleague is to have a shared mission, have a shared goal, have a shared objective and to learn about each other through this, this one goal. And, that was kind of the beauty of of how things worked. I know, like, for me, most of my friends came from collaborating on projects together, and it wasn't this, like, joking around, kind of just sitting there. Um, so that was something that was really, really important, and uh, it meant a lot, I guess, to Jason. And then at the time, we were working on a new uh, kind of experience called the Latitude Society, which I then did in Bright Axiom about. And um, we said, basically you know jason we can talk and wax poetic about this but why don't you why don't you experience uh this and uh let him go through the whole experience and uh, a happy little five years later <laughs> the show came out right at the start of the pandemic um which i don't know if that's kismet or what but uh a show about going out and exploring the world and leaving your home and meeting strangers uh, came at a very precarious moment in human history, I think. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah, but so so instead of kismet, what do you think about uh, Jungian synchronicity? Do you think, do you go that deep or? Um, I mean, my father was a, was a architect and was very into Jungian, um, like, symbology. And I know really the creator, the head, headmaster of, of all of this and all this world is Jeff Hall, who is just a scholar on on symbology. And um, I mean, I do believe in the power of, you know, just uh, on an everyday purpose or everyday level, you know, what does a logo of a company, what does that elicit in you? Especially when we think about um, these kind of modern day hieroglyphs that we see and may elicit some kind of like uh, Marcel Proustian memory. You know, the Coca-Cola symbol, everybody on this call, Coca-Cola was around, you know, 
80 years before any of us were born, we've grown up with it. It's never changed. It has connotations to it, whether it's negative or positive. But um, I think by taking certain symbols that we see every day and subverting them, uh, just through design or whatever, by subverting those symbols, I don't care if it's a crucifix or uh, you know crescent moon or star of David, if you subvert those in certain ways, you can maintain some of the emotional baggage that people have with those while leading them into new directions. So it's kind of, uh, you know, this mental jujitsu, I guess, where it's like you're using somebody's own strength to move them into a direction that you want. Um, and that's why I'm really reticent to ever, um, you know, attack somebody who's like a QAnon believer or something. The, the way to get those folks to maybe wake up is use their strength and help guide them without them even knowing you're doing it, guide them into a more constructive path. And so, you know, there's a lot of that, uh, especially in, in Bright Axiom, we, we played a lot with, um, you know, the power of symbols and tokens and, and what those mean. Um, and what does, uh, what does a hexagon mean? Why do we see it in nature? Why is a beehive, you know, six sides? And why do we, I don't know, just, just a million examples of that. But one thing we've been thinking a lot about recently, like, or at least I have, and I've had some conversations with Jeff about it, um, was sort of this idea of, you know, when the Jejun Institute first launched in 2008, it was this very novel thing. I mean, there had been orgs before that were intended to basically give people an experience to promote a product, a movie, a video game. Um, I love bees. Halo for, uh, 2, yeah. Halo 2 and stuff, yeah. Halo, yeah, the Halo 2 is I love bees. There was a, a good one for a, the Batman movie, which actually... Uh, the Dark Knight, which actually was really funny because that was happening si simultaneously to the launch of Jejun in 2008. But um, what we kind of, what was kind of interesting, I guess, about Jejun is there was no intention, there was no end point, there was no go buy the thing at the end of the road. It was simply like, this is a this is a story, and this is a way to open up your eyes and experience the world in in ways that you forgot how to do. At least since you were a child, you know, um, use your imagination and take back your city in constructive ways. But but yeah, I mean, one thing that's I've been thinking a lot about recently is, you know, in two thousand eight, there was a lot of hope. Uh, at least in the U.S., we you know we're about to get this this amazing, hopeful new president. Uh, the world was kind of calming down a little bit and maybe, I'm not trying to get political or anything, but maybe we're approaching that again, this kind of shared stasis, shared reality where, uh, you know, we've rejoined the Paris Climate Accord and, and like uh, there is hope and, and, and COVID is winding down, you know, peace is always temporary. Um, there will be some other catastrophe and, and my thought has always been, um, I don't know if you share it, but my thought has always been, if we thought, you know, the pandemic was end times, when it comes to climate change, we haven't seen anything yet. Um, and it's going to be bad. I mean, right now in California, it's the worst drought in recorded history, or at least we're approaching that right now. So my my kind of headspace right now is, is not really in creating our orgs and i don't even know if it ever necessarily was in terms of that language like these weren't really games they were almost like more guided tours almost in the way that you would go into a museum and put on a headset and uh, or walk down a city and put on a headset like in boston and it's like this is where paul revere you know lived and and uh tell you all these fun facts about it um my thinking right now is is in creating dargs, um, D, how do we de-augment reality uh, using the same technology of an arg, but to get everybody just a little pinch closer to consensus reality. And, you know, maybe one way to do that is to not necessarily um, tell them that the world is not what it seems, but to tell the world that, tell the world that the world is maybe better than it seems or it could be. Um, because I would just love, you know, 
in the last four years, we've we've society's come up with the, these terms of alternate facts, and it's like, oh God, that's that word is supposed to be uh, our word, <laughs> you know, like alternate is hijacked, is completely hijacked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was totally hijacked by the wrong people, and um, you know the the Q folks. Uh, again, I don't want to demonize them. I think they were super misled, and they. They got caught up in the power of story and the power of community by finding each other. And, um, you know, those are powerful. I just think the story that was being told to them was, I mean, obviously rid ridiculous, but it's fine to have a story that's ridiculous uh, as long as it doesn't cause somebody to go into a pizza parlor with a machine gun or try to, like, kill five Capitol Police um, in an insurrection. Uh, ours was always about trying to find the beauty and magic of the world. And as Jason Siegel refers to the whole thing is it's um, beauty as an act of defiance, you know? And I think their thing was more like, <laughs> I don't know, drinking blood. We, we have to take down, I don't know. It's just like insanity. It's like really macabre, dark stuff that uh, is not in my mind, something I want to explore. Yeah, well, we this and Peter Files and stuff, but so, you know, it, it doesn't it go there pretty easily. In an ARG, it has a tendency to kind of go into the occult quickly. That people start, you know, getting apophenia, seeing connections and stuff. And they they take it there, don't they? They, they take it to the paranormal. There's something in people that just wants to go there. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I mean, supernatural, paranormal, and science fiction, those are, those are fun things, but... I think they're they're really fun when you can actually it's hard to define exactly but it's like you can lose yourself in the story but also walk out of the movie theater and know that aliens aren't about to attack us um but sometimes for some folks um if you if you literally augment reality too much um you can that line between the proscenium and, you know, not the proscenium, it's, it's one, you know, um, and it's really kind of fun to get wrapped up in, in paranormal and the occult and science fiction, um, because so much of what Q, the QAnon thing is, and I don't mean to keep going back to them because it's, it's, I feel like that one's winding down a little bit as well, which I'm hopeful about, but, you know, um, it, it's just so much of it is science fiction. It's like scientifically impossible for these things to happen. Um, and that's also something that I'm really interested in as well. I just, um, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of people who have studied the Q phenomenon a lot more than I have. And at the end of the day, I'm, I'm really not so much of a like game designer or, um, you know, alternate reality person. I, I, like to make films and, um, <laughs> and part of like one of my next doc films is it's just a straight doc, uh, kind of in praise of, of science, but also weird science, um, and kind of getting people to say, to see that, um, science itself not only is reality or hopes to be reality, it's the pursuit of reality, um, but it can be stranger than fiction. So, working on this thing about uh, dog cloning and pet cloning, which is a real thing around the world. And and hopefully if oh, people yeah, can... Oh, in Korea, they've done it. Yeah, they, I mean, they've done human cloning. Um, uh, basically, the designer babies now from this Chinese guy. <laughs> well, yeah. But, I mean, that, that's kind of my point, is you don't need to escape into fiction to see how bizarre our reality is um, at times. And if you love science fiction... Wait till you take a deep dive into, you know, the strange oddities of, of how reality works, you know? Um, so what I'm interested in now is these, like, stranger than fiction moments um, and using those to get people to um, latch on to pr the pursuit of reality and truth. Yeah, I, I can tell you a few of those. What comes to mind, there, there are lots of, you know, fascinating but forgotten stories in science and one of them that is completely out of the public purview but i, I think is a fascinating story was the pursuit of absolute zero so all these guys like kamala Nonis and stuff like that they 
they liquefied helium and uh, they carried on going down the periodic table liquefying things and it's it's it was like the space race of the you know the early 20th century and it's completely forgotten now but the story was epic you know with with exploding machines and disasters and people that just devoted their whole life to it and you know it was an international race and it's it's completely forgotten but i, I advise you to look into come on and uh, the, that i love it i absolutely, absolutely will because i mean i think you could take an entire org or you could create one and do it with those those uh hidden gems of science and and history that are totally forgotten um you know there's so many moments like that um and maybe you don't need to invent an entire fake world you just need to create one that is real but so unbelievable that you you your brain goes to that same um technology of an org to think oh well, this couldn't have happened and then you go deeper and you go Oh my gosh, this did happen. Uh, I mean, an example of that was, and this is probably something we wouldn't do in this day and age, but you know, the the idea of the institute was there's this girl that went missing in 1988, um, 20 years ago from when it launched, and uh, you know, there were enough clues and moments that were really well crafted to get a lot of the people saying, "I actually think this whole thing is just to find this actual real person." Um, the real person or the Ava character is based on kind of an amalgam of people that Jeff knew, uh, who did, some of them did just kind of disappear off the face of the earth, but there was no real like Ava necessarily, but there was just enough of that truth to get people in, in, uh, invested. But what if you gave them an absolute truth? So an example being, um, you know, I don't know if you saw three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri with uh, Frances McDormand, but, uh, you know, her daughter goes missing um, and she puts up these billboards because nobody's doing anything about it. Well, those billboards, in a sense, are augmenting reality, you know, augmenting people's scope of what reality is. And, and maybe you can do the same, like if nobody's looking for your daughter or nobody's working to help do anything about climate change, um, maybe you can augment reality in order to get them to that point Z without them ever knowing necessarily when they go down that rabbit hole that, oh, I'm here to basically help build more desalinization plants or more solar or anything like that. It's, it's like, you're starting down this rabbit hole, you don't know where it's gonna go, but along the way, you're actually learning things that will take you to a constructive output um, because, Ultimately, at the end of the day, like Jejun and the Institute, it didn't have necessarily a, a socio-political uh, call to action. At the end, it was literally like, look, you've all come together. You wouldn't have met each other. And that in itself is, is beautiful. But I think for, for your initiatives, you know, um, the, the output, the buying the Reese's peanut butter cups or the video game at the end of the tunnel for you could be whatever climate initiative you think is best um yeah. You know. yeah yeah so we've done political stuff like you know kind of riffing off eva is um like you know lost boy campaign where basically we have just a picture of lost boy lost boy happens to be the real dalai lama who's kind of disappeared in china <laughs> so anybody that actually takes it seriously goes for the qr code goes down this rabbit, rabbit hole that is for real they have a fake Dalai Lama that the CCP has created and stuff. So it's it's political dynamite for China. But you know, you just have this <laughs> picture of this kid and stuff, and people think, oh, maybe it is a lost kid, and do a little Google image search on the thing, and they'll find out this. What? Why doesn't anybody talk about this story? <laughs> exactly. So, so big, big opportunity for for that for you know political activism. But uh, do you know about um, Vladislav Surkov and the stuff that he did in the Soviet Union? Um, um, it sounds familiar, but no, uh, fill me in. Well, well, that, well, that's fascinating stuff because he's taken really the, the whole ARG concept and, and Putin stays in power <laughs> largely because they, they call it active measures. But it, it came from, you know, Western psyops that were 
developed um, since World War One, and it, it is it is an art, it's basically. And so, it, he comes from the avant-garde theatre um, world, and he he applied all these techniques uh, to Putin in Russia, and then they weaponized them and used them in the Ukraine, and for you know all the they do it very very well. Um, and uh, yeah, Adam Curtis did, did mentioned it in a documentary of his. He did a did very good treatment. Adam Curtis, if you don't know, is this English uh, documentary maker. Um, he a BBC documentary maker, and he, he seems to have access to the BBC library and a very very good memory. So he hauls out all these gems from the BBC archives. Of course, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yes, I know exactly. Oh what yeah, you're he's, about. he's a, he has a cult following. It's a, oh yeah, people, he did, the, he did a big right. release a couple years ago that kind of almost became viral. Um, yeah, yeah, I know exactly. Like what you're talking about. Nightmares or uh, hypernormalization? I think the, the, the big thing. Yeah. Well, well, Sokov is in the in the hypernormalization one, so. I, I would highly recommend going back and looking over that stuff because because this I mean the, the number of people that have figured out this this arg format and as a weapon and in fact all the Q guys they I, re, I was really upset by all of that because I've been working on this for 10 years in essence to do what they did on the left and yeah I really felt pipped at the post is like they, they did in 10 years I mean, they, they did in two years and with four million bucks, what, what I've done, uh, just just financed myself over the last 10 years. Um, but anyway, you, you're completely guilty because you <laughs> set me up on that part. I'm, <laughs> Jeff, I'm <I> was, sorry. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, in so many ways, I'm the I'm kind of the the propaganda, you know, uh, slinger of this world like i fell in love with it i got to help build the video installations for the original piece but when when it was over even working with them and jeff and everybody involved i still had so many questions and that's when i kind of was like i i, I want to investigate this i want to like really put this together um and understand what this meant to people uh, and why it resonated so as much as it did um but yeah, that's that's really fascinating. Oh, oh I can I can help you fill you in there because um, my most formative years uh, as a kid, from about fifteen on, was spent in a cult. In fact, my mom studied comparative religion, and she did a thesis on my experience in this this cult that's still going. It's 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 kind of worldwide, but not it doesn't really have the power that it used to. I think the main it, kind of like, price. what was it? Was it when, the, the it? church of economic science in, in the UK. Um, uh, but there's a book that was written about called the cult um, in the eighties, but it was very in, influential when I was in it in the eighties, there was, I think Maggie Thatcher had a couple of guys in, in her cabinet that were in it. So it got into the news, they got found out and got into the newspapers and they were like secret cult of influence. <laughs> it was the, the main theme. Um, and so there was a lot of controversy uh, at that time. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, I, from that experience, I absolutely adore cults because, uh, you know, it's just so awesome to be in them. And you, you know from like la the latitude, right? You know exactly the dynamic. So I've spent, yeah, you know, my whole life uh, kind of um, unpacking my experiences in that cult, and and they've never gone away because almost everything, as far as I can tell, is a cult. I mean, when I go, you know, I worked in American corporations, I've made my own corporations, and I tell you, they're cults. They all cults. I mean, nobody recognizes it, but they are. <laughs> they all have the dynamics of a cult. And yeah. so, so I made a study out of cults, and then you know, it's just. What an ARG is, is a cult uh, just updated to all the tools of, of the digital age. This is really all, all it is. But every experience that I've had in, in that cult, the School of Economic Sciences, is uh, what you guys are doing. I can see it straight out in the latitude. But I, I got, I, I've been kind of fascinated by it because I can see there's something deeper in it. There's a, you, know, you can see maybe it's the tip of the iceberg, especially with Jeff Hull. I think he's holding something back. He he has a much deeper, deeper agenda, and he's 
you know, you can see in interviews and stuff, you'll, you'll go so far, but there's, there's a lot more to this than he's actually saying. I mean, his, so, his go-to quote is always, uh, I, can, I can remove the curtain, but behind that, there's just another curtain, um, you know, and, and so on and so on. And I think that, that speaks to who he is a little bit. Um, there's yeah. Definitely, uh, yeah, he's and, definitely an onion there. He's really, he doesn't peel back many, many issues of the onion. But yeah, so um, yeah, if, if you have any doubts about what happened in the latitude, I, I can definitely fill you in on, on the territory and why, how things unfold. But um, it, what did, I mean, I've read the stuff on like Mother Jones and stuff, but why did the latitudes unravel? And I mean, every, a lot of people were really upset and traumatized. And, and yeah. uh, I think Jeff Hall took a bit of flack for that because he did it rather abruptly and just removed all the funding, right? So, so what, what's your take on the unraveling? So, well, let me charge you with this. Why it was so cool and why it turned so bad, which was what Jeff Hall was saying in his kind of uh, valid letter to everybody he said you know like it's amazing how something for it was created for fun and whimsy and stuff turned out to be a trauma for so many people <laughs> so how, how do you answer all of that um i mean there's a lot of components and and to be honest it's it's hard to get a lot of those people to actually give give the specifics necessarily of what it was that was so rough but what I do know is, um, you know, it's very possible that we were kind of, it's like, uh, I think as Jurassic Park says, it's like a kid finding their dad's gun a little bit and uh, not exactly knowing what to do with it, but knowing all of a sudden I have this very powerful um, tool and it could go off at any moment. And part of what the latitude design was, was, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I think a lot of people who gravitate towards this, or um, I could even talk about Q a little bit, because there's a lot of like Judeo-Christian um, undertones to it, and like kind of these end times, Book of Revelations more things. Than that, that, more than that, theosophical and stuff, it, it, it goes into esoteric, uh, occult Nazism and stuff. Like that. Yeah, and so part of what was done with the latitude was for a lot of the folks that got involved more so I think than Jejun was um, these were people myself included who had grown up with some form of a religious upbringing um, and had kind of abandoned it at some point in their life uh, maybe maybe it's good moving to a coastal city or whatever you know um, and the technology of the latitude was very much using um, using the tools and rituals and moments from kind of augmented reality, like augmented, or sorry, augmented theology, um, I, I put it. So, you know, there's the Eucharist and, and drinking the blood of Christ and, and all of that stuff. And then basically what we did was, and I think it's even worded in the doc, but it's like, um, these were people who found an environment where they could be religious but not spiritual, where they could say, I love ritual, I love congregation, I love this, I haven't had this since I was a little kid, and, and therefore you're also kind of playing with this strange sense of like nostalgia, but it's a latent nostalgia that I think, um, it's not like, oh, I love watching Star Wars, uh, you know, I love Chewbacca, it, it, I'd love to see him again. It's kind of this latent, unspoken sense of uh, both nostalgia and theological longing um, and congregation, uh, ritual, again, you know, coming together for a shared purpose, which can be very, very powerful. And, you know, you speak of cults, I, I don't, I mean, you could make the argument that everything is a cult, but I think sometimes what should differentiate a cult from a religion, and I'm not talking about Catholicism or Buddhism, but because a lot of them have a central figurehead, um, but the idea of decentralization of, I guess, the book itself um, being your 
axis mundi, the center of the world, the universe, you know. And with cults, they're usually, at least the nefarious ones that we always hear and see documentaries about, they're cults of personality. And I don't think necessarily Jeff wanted to be that, although that's what he became for a lot of people. He was this mysterious man behind the curtain. And he was bleeding money. Um, and there, I think, were a, a number of folks who were upset at the way that that was being handled. Um, and I think he was getting, you know, stressed about it. And um, it's kind of like, what if one day the Pope said, sorry, Catholicism's done now, like close every church. Um, that's not going to happen. But because this was such a micro small climate of people, you know, that could happen, especially if it's the Pope who's paying the rent on each one of those churches and is draining a whole lot of money. I'm not overly trying to, you know, defend the rapid shutdown that happened. But at the same time, I mean, uh, you know, I've been laid off of jobs before. I, I've never had a job where the boss or the owner says, okay, in three weeks, we're going to lay you off. Uh, you know, it's, it's always an immediate thing. Um, and that's not to say that a lot of the people who were, you know, upset, um, hadn't had experiences with that before. But I mean, at the end of the day, um, I think there was a lot of stress and he was bleeding money and, you know, shut the doors immediately. And I think Jeff would be the first person to say, you know, um, that that was probably a mistake, uh, or it could have been handled better. I think it was going to shut down no matter what, but it could have been probably handled better. And that kind of goes back to my, my thinking now, um, about that kind of emotional jujitsu that you do. Um, okay. So the insurrection at the Capitol failed, but you, because Q didn't have that one person necessarily, uh, although I guess there is a Q, that one person funding everything, um, there was no way to shut it down. And I think actually what's happening with the whole Q thing right now is is almost a little bit more healthy um, in how it's ending because had it been shut down right away, there would have just been some other conspiracy about, oh, the government did this, now we really have to attack. And now is like really all hell breaking loose. But because they keep having these um, these kind of deadlines of things that they think are going to happen that keep getting pushed out and out, I think the next one's supposed to happen in a few weeks where Trump is going to re-enter yeah. office. Yeah, you know, the storm, the storm. Yeah. The storm, <laughs> the storm. Right. They, it enables Another failed prophecy. <laughs> right. And, and the, there'll be a million of those. I mean, anytime there's a doomsday theory, whether it's 2012 or that religious group who put flyers all over the Bay Area saying end times on like May 23rd of 2009. You know, end times are <laughs> always going to be that, that's coming. That's probably the 101 is, is, is don't put a date on your end time. <laughs> big, big fucking mistake. Rookie mistake. <laughs> Rookie mistake. But, um, Keep it Keep it but that's the, the end thing times is, coming, it's got to be right around the freaking corner. But yeah. Don't put a dash on it. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I mean, by shutting down the latitude, uh, if he had put a date on it, um, I don't know. Would that ha have then enabled a lot of the people involved to say? Oh, well, it, it, I have hope. It's not going to shut down then, or it is, or if it doesn't, then another two months. We've got another two months or something like that. But what's yeah. what's healthy, I think, right now is just this very slow trickle out and dissolve of Q members where it's like, man, I was told January 6th. Like, I knew that in my heart. Okay, I know the next date's coming. I'll wait for that, but my belief is going to dwindle dwindle a little bit more um so i just i think you just don't want to pull the rug out from anyone um you uh, know in my, my experiences and uh, you know a serial entrepreneur and stuff is i've had to close down small companies and stuff of about 30 people and so, um there's no nice way to do it in fact I, I would recommend doing it the way jeff did it because um you can really string out the agony because 
Yeah, a, a small company also is a cult. It's a, basically people only join a small company by a sort of religious conviction. So, you, you you know, they will do anything. They will bleed on the floor to keep it going. And at some stage, you just say, look, you just got to take this Band-Aid off and rip it off quickly. So, I, uh, but um, did Jeff share with you that he was bleeding with the, with the capital? I think I got the impression that he didn't share the finances enough. So everybody was like playing along. And they didn't realize that it actually cost money. He was kind of, <laughs> he wasn't really upfront about that. And then it's something, you, you know, everybody's thinking, hey, this is, this is the internet, it's free, isn't it? <laughs> like yeah. everybody thinks it's free today. <laughs> you know, they like, wouldn't pay for bullshit, you know. It's like, uh, you know, um, I, I started a couple of years ago to get, to get my art going. I started making movies as a complete rank amateur and it shows, oh, by the way, on, um, on YouTube, and I never respected filmmakers like you before I made one afterwards. Now I'm like, oh, <laughs> huge respect. <laughs> I'm sorry I doubted you. <laughs> you know, I was like, but for the average dude, they, they so they expect so much for free. Like it's it's very hard to, to fund these things. But, but yeah. so anyway, I'm wrapping on. But there's there's, there's no such thing as a free lunch. I mean, that's that's the thing that the all that there is to the internet audience, right? But, Everybody but on the internet, everything's free. Well, but see, that's the hope. But the reality is, no, there isn't. So for me, it's like if I'm going to use Facebook, I'm going to assume they're going to use my data. Like I'm going, like how do I? I mean, yes, or. I could just get barraged with ads, I guess, and that's their revenue model. I mean, that's fine, but I just, I've, I've never believed in a free launch. <laughs> you know, there's always a catch. Um, well, well, if you're a creator, then you know what it is to starve and not get paid for your work. So, yeah, but, but for the consumers, they've just been, you know, since the beginning of the internet age, because there were so many startups and they're all competing for mind space and just market share, then they all offered a freemium module, module. And so we've had 20 years where nobody had to pay for anything. That didn't used to be the case. If you bought a newspaper, you had to pay for it in the old days. <laughs> yes. Now everybody thinks newspapers, they're free, aren't they? It's like, no, actually, people have to get paid. Well, but, I mean, um, maybe, maybe some places are kind of learning that lesson. I mean, the New York Times, um, if you want to read it, you need a subscription to it. It's like, we're not going to rely on advertising. That's not how this works. And we're not getting your 50 cents every Sunday. So um, that's that's how this is going to have to work um, at this point. And yeah, I mean, it's just so fascinating. It's almost, you know, what's an alternate reality is market valuation. <laughs> you know, the idea that- The stock market. The stock market. I mean, that is, that is just illusion. Um, and it's real in that, yes, you can sell and you can then go buy, you know, whatever um, that's tangible, something you can hold. But just the idea that, you know, Twitter has never been making any money and it's valued at, you know, whatever, $10 billion or, um, or Tesla. Uber. Tesla would take a thousand years to basically earn a <laughs> revenue back on its market cap. It's like, right. what are these people thinking? It's just fantasy, yeah. It's just kind of fantasy, but we just kind of go along with it. And in that case, I mean, maybe there's no such thing as an alternate reality game or group. Oh, okay, <laughs> you know? so I'm not giving up on this one. Let me tell you this. So, okay. so after I saw the Institute uh, and thought this is the way to go, I, I got a bit of misinformation somehow. And I it was... In my research, basically, I've, I found how was this finance was the first thing I was like, some business brain, right? So um, the bit of misinformation I got was that it was a 10 grand art project and it was done on a shoestring. And then when the money was gone, it, that was the end of the project. Um, I, I sort of re realized now that, you know, that wasn't correct. I think Jeff Hull pumped two million into it and stuff. It was uh, it was uh, maybe much more than that. Well, no, uh, for at least forty grand or something, isn't it? Into the institute movie the production costs were low, but they were so, on a shoestring. Well, so are you referring to the film itself or the actual full experience? Because they're they're well, sort the of Jejun, two different things. The the Jejun Institute when it started 
with the jejun. The jejun part of it was done on the shoestring, wasn't it? It was latitude then. Jeff put in about two million. Didn't he? Uh, I think it's actually closer to three million. Uh, of his just uh, personal equity um, or private investment. Um, Jijun was much cheaper. And uh, something that was really smart about it was that it was intended from the very beginning to be a, not temporary, because I mean, it lasted for three years, but um, well, yes, temporary, just a short, there was going to be an end. The end is we have to find Ava. Once she is found or determined what happened to her, game over and proof of concept is is then done. Um, and that was generally at least like a shared um, belief or understanding, I think, with a lot of people is like, this will end, I think, including the employees um, of which there were really only like a couple other folks that uh, at that time opposed to the latitude, which I think at one time had like, you know, uh, tens of of 20s of employees or something like that. Um, so yeah, Zhejun was done at a shoestring budget. There wasn't a giant haunted house that was constructed under under the city. Um, you know, it was it was about small installations and a lot of design and just video. And it, there was no like architecture necessarily besides maybe there was a lot of art direction and interior design, which came from Jeff, like around the room or, you know, stuff like that. But it was, it was really about these little things that you find. I mean, there's stuff in, in the Institute that it, it just couldn't fit in, but were so brilliant where it was like, you need to find the world's smallest post office. And, uh, they would install these little like mailboxes, um, you know, almost kind of, um, uh, the, you know, Thomas Pinchon's Crying of Lot 49, sort of the, the Thurn and, and Taxis, um, kind of like these two competing postal services. Anyway, so just all over the place, there would be these very small little like um, post offices and you could literally deposit a little teeny tiny envelope into it and it would go to where it was supposed to go. So I don't know, there was, there was a lot of stuff like that, but it was all very micro um, opposed to the grandness and large, uh, I don't know, uh, just the grandness of the latitude. I think the latitude was just too big. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I got that impression too. So, so what I did after that, the conclusion I came to after that, that uh, I thought the major part, well, when I saw what you did in 2013, then I thought, why did you stop? I mean, I thought this is a gold mine. I can monetize this. It can carry on forever. So I had this the the idea that it can be self-funding and organic. I always tried to do my startup companies that way. I, I you know, under huge pressure to take on investors, I never did. I always grew them, and always had a rule that basically, you know, that's uh, you you can only grow on the revenue you earn. So you have to be revenue positive from the get go. Now, as an internet entrepreneur, they think you're a complete crackpot. I know. Because, you know, people will give you eight million and stuff. And it's caused a lot of trouble for me that the money that people have have basically offered has caused a lot of trouble and broken up one of my most successful companies because I just didn't need it. But the, the um, you know, partners, it goes to their head. You know? and so, so they they just get. But you know, if you if you can actually grow something organically, you're growing the value. And it's the internet thing was completely wrong. This thing where you build Facebook and it never makes revenue for twenty years. It's it's complete nonsense. It's just a Ponzi scheme. So, but so, but when I when I grew a company that way organically um, and and revenue positive from day one and never going into the red. Uh, just built it on earnings. It's it's slow, but the value increases phenomenally. So by the time you know, basically, I had investors pounding on my door uh, to to invest, and you know, getting huge valuations and stuff. Where everybody else who's just trying to you know borrow money uh, to to become Facebook, and that just just wasn't shaping. Uh, but so so that's the way I thought, and I thought well. And odd, like you guys were doing at the institute, that I can figure out how to how to monetize that. So the idea I came up with was you you do a kind of a, a 
play money in the game. So you run with the play money in the game. So it's, I, I, I've always hated blockchain and, um, it, uh, you know, blockchain, I just found out about at that time, I had a lot of people, like, oh, you're blockchain. <laughs> Because they're like, no, I, as far as I can tell, it's an uh, NSA sting, sting operation. It doesn't scale. It's a, it's, it's a real vulnerable thing. And um, I think I've been absolutely proved right, <laughs> by the way. But <laughs> I've got into a lot of arguments for saying that. But the, um, but the idea is that you you have an, a kind of anti-Bitcoin. You have it centralized. And, and then the, the currency itself is like taggable, a bit like you know, Twitter things where you can put a hashtag on the currency. So you can, a bit of currency that you spend, the hashtag will stay with the currency and go through the network. And then the proof of work in sort of Bitcoin mining, I wanted it to be democratic and make all the players make it. So, so basically you create the currency by just scanning QR codes on people's phones and finding geocaches and stuff like that. So you, you, the money is created by play in the game. And then I thought, well, you give the thing value by having a little exchange on the back end where somewhere in a little dark corner, you have it actually exchanged for physical gold and silver. So you have a, a you know, gold back currency. And I, I figured that's enough to, to run the whole game. It's a fake currency, so it doesn't get too in your face and you never think, you know, here's Halo 2 and buy, buy the next Xbox. Everybody's waiting for an ad to come up and you never have to go there. You can. You can do face pro fake products and stuff, and nobody can sue you because it's fake money. You know, so there's not a lot at stake. So that, that was my my idea, and I, you know, because I uh, have a background in software, I spent the last seven years or so developing the software for for that for that first, because I figured that was the biggest problem. So it's all there. It's all basically can be activated at a flick of a switch. Um, but and then I started started on the the, the game side and then um, well to be honest I got to 2018 and then basically decided that oh, this is pointless because <laughs> we're screwed I, I I turned into a complete doomer in 2018 and just said like everything I was trying to do is you know we're not going to make it it's just uh, everybody's heads too too deep in the sand so I kind of packed it in at that point um, and. Yeah. Uh, since oh, it, since oh, revived it, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I'm almost finished. So yeah, basically, I since revived it because I thought I owed it to people to tell them what I was doing. I had a small following and stuff on YouTube and stuff, and I thought I better tell everybody what it was about. And so, in starting to make videos to explain it, then, <laughs> then it got bigger than when I was actually doing it. So, <laughs> so, so I kind of got stuck into a new role of being a kind of a, a Duma agony aunt. So. Uh, so then I figured, well, uh, you could, uh, with, so go ahead, Sophie, yeah. Just saying a cult leader. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I'm okay. trying to get other, you can't help being a cult leader. You, you, uh, I mean, I could, I could tell Jeff Hall straight out, it, people want you to be a cult leader. You, you can't escape it. It's, it's, yeah. they, they want somebody to fill that role. Yep. It's a bummer of a roll because they're going to put you on a cross at the end of it. You wind up on the sticky end of a stick. <laughs> well, that I mean, that that's also kind of the differentiator, just really quick about you know cults and, and religions, with one exception, Scientology. But you know, almost every single cult disappears when the the leader, the Axis Munde, disappears. Um, Scientology was different, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if Jeff was out. It was it was done, you know. Um, luckily, you know. Um, luckily, there was no n nothing like you know nefarious or anything. I mean, there, what I'm getting at is, I believe there could be a benevolent cult leader, like maybe Tony Robbins or something like that. He's maybe not super benevolent, but I mean, he's not out there like beating people or you know, sexually taking advantage of his disciples or anything like that. Um, I mean, I, I believe there can be a benevolent cult leader, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I think so too. So what, what, what I tell people is I completely first own up to being a cult leader. And secondly, <laughs> say that it's a different kind of cult. It's trying to get people out of behaving cultishly. It's basically, just, it's a, you know, all, all cults promise kind of a rebirth and liberation. And so they, 
it's to say your liberation is from the, this need to belong to a freaking cult. And I, I do believe that if you are successful in a cult, you should be kind of reborn and liberated from the need to be in a cult. So you're saying, I, I, my, my shtick is that our whole culture is a cult. Um, you know, the, the, just the word culture and cultivating that they all come from the, the same Sanskrit root, which is quell, which is interesting because it's the hub of a wheel. It's kind of like the, the center of a drain. <laughs> It's rather interesting. <laughs> and so everybody in a cult is circling the drain and our whole global industrial culture is circling the drain because it it is a cult, uh, you know, and uh, a snuff cult, I think, is that too. So yeah, I agree that it, it can be done. I, I And so, yeah, that's that's our experiment and we, we're pursuing it. And it's, it's starting to get interesting. So I, I'd like to know, you know, uh, in future if, um, if we can talk again and, uh, and absolutely yeah i mean i feel yeah. like in in a lot of ways we just hit the tip of the melting iceberg uh if you will um <laughs> yeah there's there's tip of the green man ice sheet yeah there we go yeah i mean outside of or orgs um there's a lot of ways to subvert society and people's expectations um and if we talk again i'd love to kind of go into you know, the work that the Yes Men have done and, uh, you know, even Andy Kaufman did just that subversion yeah, of expectations. And, and uh, yeah. I was lucky enough to get to create one of those a few years ago, right after the election, or he really created this hoax that we were going to pay you to go protest uh, Trump's inauguration. And uh, using some very clever methods, it ended up getting national media attention, uh, ended up getting on uh, Tucker Carlson and uh, just having this ludicrous, uh, <laughs> ludicrous moment uh, interview. And you can check that out if you want. Uh, the the oh, Endeavor yeah, I will, I will. I didn't know about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can look up uh, demandprotest.com. And uh, oh, if you'd like to check out... Uh, you can just Google Tucker Carlson, uh, Dom, D-O-M, Tuipso, T-U-L-L-I-P-S-O. Um, you'll see a, a interesting little moment in a familiar face. Did, did you um, fess up to being like a fake hoax or? Nope. Oh, no, you kept it, kept it straight? Yep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> seven <okay>. minutes. <laughs> so, so you basically Sasha Baron Cohen's uh, Tucker Carlson. Yeah. And, and he, I mean, yeah, gosh, we should go into the brilliance of Sasha Baron Cohen as well, but um, unfortunately, I I gotta run to another another meeting. But I would be oh, yeah, no, more than happy to talk again in the future. Yeah, well, we'd love any advice you can give us and stuff, and we'd like to you know share our progress if you're interested in that kind of thing. But I would love to right. talk again. Right. All right. Yeah, this was excellent. really fun. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, to thank you. To talk nice to meet you, Spencer. Yeah. All right. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Thanks so much. Bye. 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 Bye.